We're going to look at Colossians chapter 1, please, and we will read verse 20. Verse 20. Now, as Bible-believing Christians, we believe that salvation is by faith alone, absolutely not by works. But different cults and religions, in fact, the whole world, in fact, the whole world, to be honest, they believe that there's something in your part where it has to have works. It's always works. Through works, you can eventually go to heaven. But Bible-believing Christians deny that. Saved Christians deny this. We believe that as Christians, we teach salvation is only by faith and not by works. Thank you, Lord. It's only by faith. It's only by faith. Faith will not include works. The world, Catholic Church, Protestant denominations, Lordship Salvation, John MacArthur, whatnot, all these guys really combine these two. They always combine these two. But we absolutely demand no. By faith, you go to heaven. However, there's a problem passage, and I'm going to help out the cults right here. You should use Colossians 1 to prove, <laughs> to prove that you have to have faith and works. Now, Paul is, we use Paul's verses so many times to prove faith alone, faith alone, not works, not works. Paul's books are filled with verses condemning works for salvation. But then the Catholic apologists and different cults, they'll argue, no, Paul is not condemning good works. Because what are you going to do with Colossians chapter 1, they'll say. Look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 21. And you that were sometimes alienated, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. So notice right here, this is talking about the cross of Christ. Now when Jesus died on the cross, what happened, they'll argue. Verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death, to present you, look at this, holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. The death of Christ made you holy, but it's based on works, not faith. Because, keep reading verse 23, if, based on the condition of what? Ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So notice right here that in verses 22 through 23, it really seems to show that if you that these things go together. It's continuing. If you get out of faith, then you lose your salvation. Thus, lose salvation. So we believe in losing salvation, and no, we don't. Okay, don't say amen to that. So here's the thing. We fully deny this. We believe once saved, always saved. We deny losing salvation. When you have some weird guys who claim to be KJV only people, independent fundamental, and they claim that uh, you can lose salvation if you stop believing in Jesus Christ for salvation, then they deny eternal security and they're liars when they say they believe in eternal That's right. security. That's good. They, are v they are really big liars. Especially you become more hypocritical criticizing other churches who preach about repentance and lordship salvation and losing salvation when you yourself are the one who teaches losing salvation if you stop believing in Jesus. So anyway, these people should be fully avoided. They're heretics. You got you to avoid those kind of people. The people you got to be listening to is once saved, always saved, even if you don't continue in the faith. Now you might say, well, that verse seems to show it. Well, here's the answer to that. When Christ died on the cross for us, did it only give us salvation or did it give us so much more? See? Here's the thing. This is a basic doctrine that you learn in Sunday school. When Christ died on the cross for us, His cross not only gave us salvation, but it gave us many other things like justification, redemption, remission, imputation, uh, blessings. But here's another thing people don't think about. It also gave us sanctification. Yeah. Oh, amen. Now, when you get saved in Jesus Christ, does that mean you never do good works and you're finished? No. When Jesus died on the cross for you, you became a saved Christian. Thus, enacting, starting... 
giving you a chance to finally do good works for Him. See, so when Jesus died on the cross, it gave you a thing called sanctification. Sanctification means separation from sin to holiness. And this is a process, you got to understand. It is a process of works. Did we get saved by sanctification? Or were we given sanctification when we believed on the cross? See that? Until you got saved by faith first. See that? Until you accepted the cross first. Nothing to do with continuing works or something. Until you accept that. Then it gives you this chance to do it. Now, let me explain right here a little more. It's a great privilege to work for the King of Kings now, thanks to the death of Christ. Read verse 22. In the body of his flesh through death. See, because of his death on the cross, it what? Sanctification here. To present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, if he continue in the faith grounded and settled. So notice that his death on the cross gave us an opportunity to work in the faith to be sanctified. Now, how we know this is really true, notice a phrase, present you holy and unblameable and re unreprovable, right? That phrase is sanctification. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. If you deny this doctrine, then you're a heretic. If you deny that after Jesus Christ died on the cross, that he gives you a chance to work for him, that you're able to live through a life of sanctification, then you're a heretic. Some people accuse us that, oh, you guys teach that once a person believes on Jesus Christ for salvation, he can sin and do whatever he wants. No, we never taught that. We believe this. No matter what sin you commit or whatever you want to do in life, only faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you do that, it will save you no matter what. Amen. Amen. But this is a separate issue here, okay? This is a separate issue. This is not talking about salvation here. We're talking about what? Sanctification. sanctification, okay? You keep mingling the two together. Yep. This one is about sanctification here, not salvation. See that? Do you think, do you honestly believe the cross of Jesus only gave salvation and that's it? Or did the cross of Christ give so much more? Now look at this, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. See, that's sanctify, sanctification. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved what? Blameless. Remember Colossians 1? Unreprovable. Uh, it says right here, presents you wholly unblameable and unreprovable, right? This is sanctification. Based on the context of when? Unto what? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. See that? This is not salvation from hell. This is sanctification related to what? Jesus coming. Why? Because when Jesus comes for his children, what does he do? Throw them in hell? No. He puts them through what? The judgment. Yeah. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. This is not the great white throne judgment, Revelation 20, where they damn people. This is a separate judgment called Judgment Seat of Christ for saved Christians, where he's coming for them. Now, look at Ephesians 5, verse 25. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. When Jesus Christ died for you on the cross... It, it was not only salvation, it was also sanctification, okay? He died because he expects for you to work for him too, not just be saved from hell. Amen. Now look at first, uh, Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and what? Gave himself for it. Why did he die? For salvation? Not in this passage. This passage is not salvation. It's what? That he might what? Sanctify and cleanse it with the washing by the word. Present tense, right? Look at verse 27. That he might what? Present it to himself. Ah, remember 1 Thessalonians 5.23? 
be sanctified, why? So that you can be presented blameless, unreprovable. That matches with 1 Thessalonians 5, with the coming of Jesus Christ's judgment, and Colossians 1, where you're blameless in his sight. There is no doubt this is a separate topic. This has to do with the coming of Jesus, sanctification. It has nothing to do with salvation from hell. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That it should be what? Holy and without blemish. Remember Colossians 1? So that you may be unreprovable, blameless, holy. See that? This context is sanctification, undoubtedly. It has nothing to do with salvation here. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Here's the thing. In this judgment seat of Christ, it has nothing to do with judging your soul. This one is soul, right? Mm -hmm. Salvation has something to do with the soul. Saving from hell. Sanctification. You got to realize this. It's not just soul, spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 said, I pray that your what? Body, soul, and spirit be preserved blameless. Sanctification is the whole thing here. You see that? Salvation, though, it only has to do with soul. It has nothing to do with the body. No, it has something to do with the body. No, you're lying. Can this body still sin today? Is it capable? Yes. Yes. Amen. Okay, so, see? You don't believe in that. And if you do, you're lying. No one believes the body gets saved. No one does. This is still sinning. There's no doubt the soul is the only thing that's saved. But what does the Bible have to do with body right here? See, because it has to do with effort. It has to do with work. You cleaning yourself because of this judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.8 proves to you the judgment seat of Christ is truly judging of the body, not soul. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.8. The Bible says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the what? Lord. Remember, God says that I present you, present you before God. See, this is a context of sanctification here. When we're presented, so when we're dead and we go before God, what is this? Wherefore we, what? Labor. See that working. You have to work. Uh, that whether present or absent, we may be what? Accepted of Him. See that? We want to be accepted by God before Him. We saw that First Thessalonians 5, Colossians 1. Because look at verse 10. For, see, explaining why. For we must all appear before what? Hell? Before the great white throne judgment to be cast into hell? No. The judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his what? Body. Body. See, not soul. Not soul. Look at Colossians 2. Colossians 2. Well, no, whatever you sin in the body, it contaminate, you know, it contaminates your soul. No. The same book, Colossians, that seemingly says you have to continue in the faith, actually says that no matter what your body does, it's separated from your soul. So no matter what sin you do in the body, it will not affect the soul. Didn't you know that? Yeah. Colossians. Colossians said that. So why would Colossians tell you to do works for your salvation if it told you that whatever you did in your body doesn't affect the soul? Now look at Colossians 2. Verse 10, 11. In whom also ye, that's you, are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Okay, circumcision. God had to cut off something from you. From you. What is it? In putting off the what? Body of the sins of the flesh. Look at that. You are cut off. You are cut off from the body of the sins of the flesh. That verse proved to you, your body still sins. Your body still has sins, but you're separated from it. See that? This is proof of eternal security. There's, 
So what if you don't continue? It has nothing to do with your soul, right? According to Colossians 2. So what if you don't continue? It has nothing to do with your soul. Your soul separated from your body. But if you don't continue, what does it have to do? Right? And remember the other verses? Why are you continuing? Present holy, blameless. Why? First Thessalonians 5 told you, because it's because of sanctification. Before the presence of God, when he judges you for your what? Boom, body. Right there. So this is utmost proof that this context of Colossians 1 has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with sanctification. Now, the utmost proof of that is just reading the whole book. If you read the whole book, there's no doubt the author's main point was that since the Colossians were already saved, mm -hmm. they should now live a sanctified life in Christ. That's the, that's the main point throughout the whole book. Because he mentions that chapter 1, verse 10, chapter 1, verse 23, chapter 2, verse 6 through 7, chapter 4, verse 12. This is especially seen when you look at chapter 3. Because he lists all the sins that they should cast off and the good works they should be doing because of their reward, not because of hellfire, but because of reward, they should cast off the sins and do good works. That's proven at Colossians 3, 24. And in fact, here's an even more biggie one. If you look at Colossians 3, 24, it proves to you you're continuing, you're doing all these things, not because of burning in hell, but because of reward. But not just because of that. If you read verse 25, Paul recognizes in Colossians 3.25, these saved by faith Christians can still sin, yet they're still saved. They can sin, and yet they're still saved, if you look at Colossians 3, verse 25. So there's no doubt, Paul, he would be double-minded then, if he's saying, you got to work hard and clean up your sins to stay saved. No. Then why would he say no matter, why would he say the sins of your body has nothing to do with your soul salvation? Why did he not mention hell at all here? Why does he say reward, reward, reward? Why is it relating to judgment, judgment, judgment? There, there you go, evidence. That's good. Yeah, that's good. That's really good.